Well, uh, let's start off. Uh, let me begin by welcoming everybody to the Future Trends Forum. I'm delighted to see you here today. We have a terrific guest on an incredibly important subject, and we have all kinds of conversation to have. And the Future Trends Forum, we cover a lot of topics. We cover everything from economics and policy to changes in culture and technology, enrollment, finance, all kinds of issues of higher education. And one thing that we've touched on a few times, but not enough, has to do with changes in global higher education, and specifically changes in terms of how academics and academic institutions respond to the legacy and afterlife of colonialism. How do we reckon with that? How do we change our practices? How do we own up to our responsibility for colonialism? How do we decolonize our institutions? How do we shed our heritage of participating in colonialism in some way? Uh, this is a topic we've touched on a couple of times, but we haven't really had a chance to delve into it too deeply, which is why I'm absolutely excited to have Dr. Oscar Mwaga here with us today. Uh, he's coming to us, I believe, from London, uh, and he's going to help us talk about this issue and work through it. Um, and as always, we'd love to hear your comments and your questions. But let me first bring Dr. Mwaga on stage, and good evening, sir. Good evening, uh, uh, Brian. Uh, thank you very much for having me, and uh, good evening, colleagues uh, from around the globe where you're meeting us. True honor uh, to be part of this distinguished gathering uh, where we are collectively exploring and uh, hopefully shaping the future of higher education. Well said, well said. Uh, first question is, where are you today? Are you in London or somewhere nearby? <laughs> no, 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 not nearby, uh, really. I, uh, I am in Southampton, Southampton which is uh, the mm -hmm. southern part of England, but I, you know, I, I occasionally work from London and uh, uh, but I live in Southampton. Uh, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Well, I should say good evening and thank you for joining us on your calendar. I really appreciate that. Um, Professor Monga, I, I asked this introductory question, uh, which may be unique. I don't know anybody else who does this, but we would we'd like you to ask to introduce yourself, not by talking about what you've done in the past, but what you're planning on doing in the future. What does the next year hold for you? What are the projects that are you know, going to be the biggest ones for you, and what topics are top of mind for you in the next year? Yeah, so so for me, uh, yeah, so I'm I'm looking into the coming year uh, with a number of uh, con interconnected projects, uh, and I have two key initiatives that I'm working on right now. And the first one is uh, working towards a project where I'm looking to work with colleagues to decolonize the curriculum. Uh, developing possibly a toolkit that is tailored for ODL, online and distance education, focusing on the programs that we have at the University of London where I work. Um, and uh, this toolkit really is designed to meet the needs of nearly 40,000 of our students who engage with our academic content, uh, 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 which is really our content is intertwined with uh, colonial histories, as, as, as you as you would, uh, you have mentioned, uh, whether through uh, their national pasts or through enduring legacies of colonialism within academia. So that's that's you know it's really working with colleagues uh, uh, where I am uh, also uh, a, a center for online and distance education fellow where we're trying to see what kind of support do colleagues need so that they can deliver uh, something close to what we could call a decolonizing uh, curriculum. Mm -hmm. My second project is quite connected to this uh, mm -hmm. in terms of sort of of like the thinking behind it. Uh, it is really an initiative, an initiative that comes from the background of my other world, which is a uh, physical activity and uh, sport. So it is what we call physically active education. Uh, it's a pedagogy that really looks at how we can use physical activity as a modality for uh, academic instruction, fostering a holistic mm -hmm. blend of cognitive, social, and physical development. So this is what we're trying to do in my native country, which is Zambia, where we're trying to bring in uh, this uh, physically active curriculum for our children who are predominantly becoming physically inactive. But uh, underpinning all this project is really our thinking of uh, around innovation and uh, you know decolonial uh, pedagogies. So that's the two main ones that I'll be involved with this year and part of next year. Two huge topics, and uh, I, I, I look forward to seeing where you go with them. And of course, it'd be great to see their connections. Um, well, uh, 
for uh, Dr. Mwanga and, and for everybody, uh, the way this usually works in the forum is I'm going to ask our guest a couple of very basic introductory questions. And as, as our guest answers, please think about what questions you would like to ask, because once I'm done with those two questions, it's going to be over to you. So you know, think about the, in general, the, the topic of decolonizing higher education, but also think about the details and the ideas that uh, Dr. Mwanga is going to mention in response to my questions. So just to, just to begin with, um, I'm very, very curious about uh, many different dimensions of this problem. Um, and one I'd like to ask is, how do we change not the research, not the pedagogy of higher education, but how do we decolonize the curriculum of higher education? How do we change what we teach? What, what are some of your thoughts about that? Yeah, thank you. Thank you very, very, very great. Good question, uh, Brian, really great question. But I think, so for me to, to respond to that question, I, I just want to take colleagues and friends back to this idea um, that uh, a South American uh, scholar by the name of uh, Walter Minio and his colleagues, uh, 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 Quinjano, talk about. They talk about uh, the decolonial turn. And according to them, uh, the decolonial turn is a persistent, uh, it's a response to the coloniality of knowledge and power. And they define coloniality as, uh, you know, not just uh, a relic of a bygone era, but a living, breathing structure, uh, an entrenched infra infrastructure of thought and practice that continues to shape our world in profound ways. Uh, so it's within this framework that uh, modernity has been constructed and perpetuated and, and evolves into this overwhelming force that has embedded itself within our institutions, including higher education. So they, they like us to, to start from what is this, this idea of decolonial turn before we can actually engage on what it means to, to decolonize the curriculum. Excellent. So then therefore to decolonize the curriculum, we need to, I think we need to, to unpack some terminologies. We need to get to a place where we have some, de, uh, some uh, agreement about what we mean, you know, and some of the concepts that they put forward to us is this idea of coloniality, this idea of decolonization and decoloniality. And, and, and according to them, they see coloniality as, as a key way to understand uh, decolonization of the curriculum. And they say it's actually the dark side of modernity. It's an enduring pattern of power that has emerged from colonization and it continues to sustain <clears throat> inequalities of knowledge. Uh, and, and production and dissemination. In essence, coloniality is really this idea that feeds this this beast, if you like, of, of, of modernity. So decolonization, they say, really, it's the, it refers to the formal dismantling of colonial administration, but they want us to think of decoloniality, which to them is a deep epistemic shift, a reorientation of knowledge. Uh, I, 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 and the way we think of production of knowledge. They say that we need to think of the injustices perpetuated by the colonial of knowledge, uh, including uh, uh, other concepts like epistemic violence, where entire ways of knowing are systematically marginalized and erased from the spaces of higher education. And, 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 and sometimes the way we construct knowledge uh, is this idea that not only marginalizes others, but it puts others in, it others them, and then depicts them in a way that is easy for us to exhibit against them physical violence and other forms of violence. So they, they, they want us to go back to these pillars of thinking. They want us to, to think of the curriculum as an intellectual and, 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 and the practical engagement with the colonial turn. They want us to really dismantle these colonial biases. Uh, and where which privilege Western epistemologies while marginalizing marginalizing others where other ways of thinking, they they, they challenge us to really uh, fight the idea that decolonization is just a metaphor. Uh, they demand us to to think of decolonization as a structural change within our institutions, including decentering uh, of of Western paradigms in curriculum design and delivery of curriculum. So. That, that, so for, for them, really, it's important that we take the conversation uh, to the depth of, 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 of the way we see the world, uh, the way we, we, we relate to each other, the way we, you know, we understand ourselves. And so that when we come to the curriculum, we are more technical, but we need to in, engage in the depth of the conversation. Well, that's a, an elegant and uh, very rich answer to my kind of fumbling question. Um, you've got a, a 
you cover a wide range of, of, of points there, especially starting with the decolonial turn and, and the shift away from uh, from metaphor into practicality when it comes to higher education practice. Um, I, I have a follow-up question, um, which is, uh, I mean, you and I talked briefly about uh, what you're referring to as the uh, decolonial imagination. What, what is the decolonial imagination and how can we bring that to bear on academia? So, well, um, I, I think maybe I, before I come to your question, I just want to sort of like to, you know, to some thinking here. So uh, the so-called Global South, um, uh, you know, where I locate my, my history from, uh, you know, the, the, the way the Global South engages the world, the way it sees the world has been marginalized. So we haven't picked so much from the Global South to inform where we are today. But, but the, the Global South tends to... Uh, um, to use parable to convey deeper meaning. So if you can allow me, before I answer what the colonial imagination is all about, let me just create this illustration for, for colleagues. So, so think of uh, coloniality and modernity uh, in this way. So uh, imagine a vast ancient fortress constructed centuries ago with towering walls and, and deep foundation. Uh, this fortress was designed to protect and uphold a specific way of life one that safeguarded the interests of its constructors based on exclusion, hierarchy, and control. Uh, and really the interests of those that constructed uh, the forces. And over time, the, force, the, the fortress grew more complex with new walls, new technologies integrated, new layers of defense. The, force, the fortress has become so intricate that many have forgotten what lies at its core. Yet it continues to shape uh, the lives of those within and around it. So this fortress for me represents the infrastructure of coloniality modernity, a system engineered to protect and perpetuate a particular worldview while systematically excluding others. So higher education uh, within its traditional curricula, research agenda and pedagogical approaches has served as one of the fortress most fortified pillars. So to dismantle this fortress, we must understand how it was built what it's made of, what pillars hold it, where we should go to loosen, to loosen it. It matters uh, really, it doesn't really matter who built it, but why it was built. Um, and, and it was built by humans, it was built by us. It wasn't built by aliens, it's us. So, so that when we begin to think of the decolonial imagination, we can't imagine without understanding this fortress. So that for me, the heart of, our, of my conversation today, which is the, the idea of this decolonial imagination, is the concept not only simply uh, a, to, to have critical lens, but to really move the conversation to understand these uh, colonial flam uh, frameworks. So uh, the Calberunian philosopher by the name of Mbebe uh, noted that decolonial imagination allows us to invest in a future where the university becomes truly a place of pluralistic space uh one not one that not only acknowledges but celebrates diverse epistemologies and ways of knowing uh so so this through this decolonial lens we begin to see how higher education both historically and today functions as a critical component of this infrastructure the colonial modernity uh, which has been defined by scholars in the in the, in the global south as an uh, you know as an interconnectedness of colonial legacy and modern uh, world order a system that perpetuates the dominance of eurocentric systems while marginalizing others so it is really uh, this uh, infrastructure that up upholds the pillars of ontology ways of know of being epistemology the ways of knowing uh, pedagogy the ways of teaching and learning, if we can genuinely commit to, if we say we're genuinely committed to decolonizing the higher education, we must not only identify these pillars, but we must recognize that colonial mechanisms that continue to reinforce them, not only are abstract concepts, but they are active pervasive forces that shape uh, our institutions today. They are active, they're not gone, they're here with us. So we need to understand this infrastructure, but we need to find ways of imagining beyond it. And for me, that is yeah. what I see as the uh, as a tool of the decolonial imagination. 
Mm-hmm. What are what are? Can you give us some examples of of people or projects that are imagining beyond uh, the colonial fortress? I mean, is, is there anything that we can look to as, uh, as early early developers in that? So there 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 are, there are several, but maybe uh, to to be very uh, close to home. Uh, so at the University of London Worldwide, we run this international sports management program, which has a high number of of Olympians who are transitioning from uh, athletic careers mm. into other industries. And you see, they come from a diverse background in terms of continent, in terms of ethnicity. Um, we can say we're decolonizing the curriculum, but I think that's not enough. When we decolonize pedagogy, we begin to ask ourselves, what does it mean to teach? What does it mean to learn beyond Western uh, Eurocentric perspectives? So we, for instance, recently, we were uh, rewarding some of our Olympians who have used sport as a tool after they've retired from their athletic careers, they have used sport as a tool to transform their community. Mm. And we awarded them with what we call the Ubuntu Champions for Change uh, mm. Award. Ubuntu is a Southern Africa or worldview that states the idea that I am because we are. I can, I'm not complete without you. So my humanity is completed in you. So you can imagine these are people that have had a you know a, a great athletic career, but their humanity through through the athletic career has disappeared. So we through our program we begin to celebrate that we 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 say our program is a community with them. It's not just about them getting merits and distinctions and and passing. It's about celebrating that there, there is a world beyond our academic spaces, which is about how we relate to others, how we appreciate others, and how can we begin to celebrate that. Now, this pedagogy of Ubuntu or Ubuntu Goji says mm-hmm. that they come to our space, they're not coming as blank spaces, they're not tabula rasa, as it were. They are coming to our spaces with some knowledge that we can reorganize together and try to give them some Western uh, pedagogical and theoretical tools, which they can question and also which they can use. And if they go use them in their community and make a difference, then we're going, to say, we're going to celebrate together. So this celebration of this uh, you know, pedagogy is not just about the usual celebration. This student got a distinction, therefore we're going to celebrate. But we're also celebrating the fact that they are, they are, they are, they, the program we're giving them is allowing them to actualize their humanity. When they come to our program, mm-hmm. they see a tutor of African ethnicity and, and they say, yes, I can. I can be a tutor. Uh, they see us encouraging them and rewarding them to look at other literature. Uh, and and uh, we, we we want them to 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 tell the stories of their community. We want them to challenge. We give them marks for challenging uh, Western models, Western theoretical frameworks, and see if they can share with others, you know, other ways of of, of engaging. Well, that's a that's a very very good answer uh, to to my peremptory question. Um, I, I really like that that combination of of humanity of of make, helping them realize their humanity. Uh, as Africans abroad, uh, the, the, let me stop asking questions, uh, Dr. Mwanga, because I, I don't want to monopolize the floor. This is all about uh, the audience here and everybody involved. Uh, now, this is the time for your questions. This is the time for uh, your comments. And uh, again, please, if you'd like, uh, just if you'd like to join us on stage, you can just click the raised hand button and uh, we'll be happy to put you up on stage. And if you want to type in a question, just click the question mark button and uh, and start typing. In fact, we already have a couple of questions in the hopper. So let me just bring in one. Uh, this is from our good friend, uh, Philip Lingard in Malta. And he asks this, Africa is underserved by higher education. Will the ketchup be by universities as we know them expanding or will there be a new model of delivering learning? That, that's a very, very interesting question. Um, I do not think that, uh, I do not think that Africa will catch up. Because uh, the architecture of, 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 of uh, modernity is such that Africa shouldn't catch up. I think what we need to do is deconstruct that architecture. Mm. That architecture is those who are going to be ahead will be, are in the epicenter, which is the, the, the Europe and Western 
are places. Those that are in the periphery, we make them believe they'll catch up, but they would never really catch up. So practically, it, it's very difficult to find funding for research. Practically, it's very difficult for African researchers to, to publish. So, uh, and then, you know, what you get is aid organizations trying to support them here and there to do uh, uh, research. But, uh, uh, you know, the, the research that ends up happening is the research which is determined outside Africa, is pedagogies that are determined outside Africa. So, uh, for me, uh, using this decolonial imagination, for me, is to say we need to disrupt that. We need to look at changing the conversation, changing the narrative. We need to say, uh, how can we begin to actually appreciate others, other ways of, of, of knowing? What are the other ways of knowing that Africa brings to the space? And I'll give an example, for instance. Yeah. Uh, physically active education, which I'm involved with, is now uh, with public, so it can, be, it can appear in the Africa Union policy for African states, that they should focus on making the curriculum physically active. Now, children in the rural areas in Africa are very physically active because they have to run to school go and get back. Uh, uh, and But those that are in cities are becoming physically inactive because, you know, they've got mob automobiles and all that. So in terms of researching this area, if the agenda is set by UNESCO, UNESCO is telling Africa that you need to include quality PE. So Africa, which is really trying to catch up with mathematics and English, is getting the kids to sit down and not be physically active. And they're thinking, we can't and catch up with the worst because you know we we, do, we don't have time to do quality physical education but if you change that argument and say well you have open spaces in africa you are uh, you you have spaces that other continents don't, don't enjoy so your kids are always running now why don't we start there what why, why don't we ask the children to, to to think of and the teachers to think how can i learn geography by going out of the classroom open up the classroom uh, and how can research actually try to look at those kind of questions? Now, if you start to say the African child is, is going out and, and learning by going out of the classroom and, and the pedagogies are changing, you will actually see that the African child is benefiting from physical activity. They are increasing more steps, but they are able to actually incorporate that in a way that it makes sense because they can meet the curriculum targets. They, they can also meet the health targets, they'll become healthier, and they, and they, they can meet this holistic agenda. So my, my argument here is that we, we, we gotta have to look different the way we're looking. The, the current architecture confines us to ask particular questions. And therefore, as we ask those questions, we'll never, che we'll never catch up as Africans. We, what we need to do is to find, it, find ways that challenge the architecture the current architecture of how knowledge uh, is, 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 is created and how we see the world. Well, first of all, uh, Philip, thank you for the really, really good question. And good evening to you in the, in the warm Mediterranean. And uh, Dr. Mwaga, thank you for the, for the excellent answer. Um, I really like the uh, combination of uh, physical learning in this case. Uh, friends, that's an example of a Q&A box question. So for you know your question, please, that's one way, the very bottom of the screen, just find that uh, question mark uh, box and start typing. We have another such question coming to us from uh, Professor Stephen Volk at uh, Oberlin College. And uh, Professor Monga, I need to read this in two parts because it, it just kind of broke up. So you'll see what I mean. It's, it's, it's a very powerful question. Uh, he begins by saying, I love the image of the fortress. The question for me in the USA where there is a concerted effort to crush all diversity, equity, and inclusion initiatives, and to emphasize precisely the colonial history of our country, what would you recommend as early steps to help faculty see the fortress? So how, wow. can, how can American faculty, how can we help American faculty see this fortress of colonialism in the midst of political backlash? Ooh, that's a very powerful question. Uh, how can we help them see it? Um, um, I think I think we have to start with the conversation we are having. We have to start with what's on the agenda on that conversation that we are having. Um, it, you know, so we we have to start to ask ourselves the question: When we have conversations, be it through the curriculum, be it through the different ways that we are engaging, what's on that agenda? What are we discussing? Are we having a discussion that talks about uh, a reading list that includes authors? 
in their diversity? Or are we having a conversation that says, why should these three things be like that? You know, so I, I get colleagues, you know, saying, you know, you know, we're decolonizing because, you know, we are diversifying the reading list. That's fine. But where is the conversation as to why have we landed here? Why do we only have, uh, you know, Eurocentric? Uh, 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 why do we only have, uh, you know, uh, uh, males within the, you know, the Eurocentric system as the authors? Where are the others? So when you have that conversation with faculty when you when, when you create spaces of that conversation hopefully you begin to get to places where faculty themselves they will start to suggest what kind of initiatives should come out of it so we sustain this conversation which is not just the practical side of things but it's the the, de the deeper questions of where we find ourselves um, one of my experiences has been um, when we try to look in the rear view mirror in the past uh, it creates certain tensions, certain apprehensions. People are not comfortable because it appears as if there's a blame about who did what historically. Well, mm -hmm. we, you know, if you look at the history of colonialism here in England, you discover that England is a class system. So before colonialism is, in, is, 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 is taken to Africa, well, it's happening in England. It's happening in England before it goes to Africa. So this is not really about England or Europe against Africa. This is about how humans try to protect resources, how humans try to safeguard their places. So they create, you know, hierarchies, they create control. So their side of things will be sustained. All right. So what we, there's a saying in Nigeria, when we talk about energy, they say, you know, there's enough sun for everyone. So mm -hmm. if you have a debate of saying we don't have enough uh, petroleum, well, mm -hmm. there's enough sun for everyone. So sometimes we need to open up and see uh, a different way of seeing that there's enough. And if there's enough, let's talk about how we can we can start to, sh we, can, uh, we can share. Let's talk about pedagogies of empathy. How do you begin to actually situate empathy in your curriculum? Can you help children understand what it means to be in another person's shoes, to walk another person's shoes? Uh, uh, if you have a curriculum that, I come from uh, Zambia, and in the southern part of Zambia, we have a town called Livingston. Now, Livingston is named after Dr. Livingston, who was an explorer, who I was told in primary school that discovered the Victoria Falls. Mm. Image we're looking at in primary school. It was Dr. Livingston being carried by the natives of, of that area to the, where the Vic Falls is. And, and, well, he discovered it, but they took him there. So that was in my curriculum. So if you if you think about it, it, it's about also not having a single story in our curriculum, but having multiple stories. So when we, when we are talking about uh, what can we do in these faculties, we should always be uncomfortable when there's a single story that is informing our curriculum, when there's a single perspective that is informing our research, when there's a single perspective that is informing the way we engage. So, uh, you know, I don't know how deep the challenge is in America, but I think when we create a space where multiple voices, multiple ways of knowing are, 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 are allowed to come in, it's great. But here's a challenge, and, and I'll end there. The, the colonial, coloniality modernity uh, beast or infrastructure is very interesting if you look at it. It's structured in its engineering to listen from within. It doesn't listen from outside. So the West listens to itself. Now, your reaction and my reaction, Brian, is to tell people to say, oh, increase the voices of the marginalized. Well, what mm -hmm. if this is not listening? It doesn't have ears that are facing outside. The ears are facing inward to itself. So forget about the voices. Try to understand why is Western pedagogy not listening to other pedagogies? How can we begin to re-engineer it? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. surgically, so it's are also facing outwards and it can listen to other voices so it's not just increasing the voices in the faculty it's also preparing and understanding this fortress in a way that it can be able to listen both inside and outside mm. that's a very very rich answer um I, I i i i love the way that this hits so many different points um and i love the way that you work with steven's excellent um call to see the fortress um, thank you. Thank you both very much. We have more questions coming in. 
and um, and I, I also thought I would just adjust the screen here to to you know um, make make it a little more balanced. Uh, and let me bring up on stage a couple of video questions. Uh, we have one uh, from our friend in Arizona, Dr. Bay Rodriguez Franson. So let me bring her up on stage. And there we go. Hello, welcome, Director. Hi, thank you so much uh, for choosing this topic and having this space uh, to discuss decolonizing higher, higher education. Uh, before I get to my question, I wanted to see if I can connect with Dr. Bulk. Um, I'd be willing to um, collaborate with you on how we might uh, encourage faculty to see the fortress, um, maybe have some discussions on that. Um, so uh, Dr. Mwanga, um, I, I thank you so much for your work and really excited and also hopefully connect with you on future collaborations as well. Um, so I grew up in the Philippines and basketball was practically our national sport, <laughs> even though, you know, it's not meant for us really. It's, I'm 5'2", for example, and I played basketball for seven years. Oh. I was a Michael Jordan <laughs> fan. But it's really oh, an expression, yeah. it's, it's really the uh, legacy of uh, American colonialism. Uh, and um, and so I wonder, the first question is, how do we, because it's so embedded, you know, in our schools, you know, Department of Education kind of, you know, uh, pushes that as a sport. Uh, the Philippine Basketball Association, fashioned after NBA, is really popular across the nation um, and also, um, Outside of the U.S., the Philippines is the second largest market for the NBA. Uh, hmm. So, first is how do we how do we um, kind of uh, encourage more indigenous sports or sports that are at least more suited for our physicality and you know uh, the the Filipino people. And then the second is what are your thoughts on uh, the Olympics, for example, which is based on very Eurocentric um, notions of uh, a sport. Wow, good questions. Um, yeah, so, so as it happens, uh, 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 Dr. Uh, Rodriguez, I am I'm, 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 I'm a former basketball player. Um, so, 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 so my son is very active in basketball. I, I played basketball when I did my scholarship. When I left Zambia, I was a, I was a player coach in Norway, in, in Oslo. So, so basketball has been my life. So I know the story. I know there's an NBA, a former NBA player, Superman, who's in Philippines. I think he set up his own league there. So it is really fascinating. Um, there, there are two responses I'd like to give to that. Um, so what has happened to the Philippines? The first thing is to acknowledge that it has, it has happened, and uh, it's not. It, it, you know, coloniality happens to all of us. We are all implicated. There's no one who, who's. Who, who can say you know, I'm not part of it? You know, at some level, we are all connected to it. Um, so it's part of our history. Uh, sometimes it's there we're going to wrestle it to ourselves. So basketball is not going to go away. It's going to be there in the Philippines. How do we make it uh, more compatible with the Philippine ways, which have also evolved? They're not the same. So this traditional idea of Philippine has moved. But I think there's a conversation to be had there. How can Sport of basketball be wrestled through the you know the the tentacles of of coloniality and colonialism, um, so so that's that's, that's a question that I, I don't really know the answer for, but uh, I can tell you uh, an example which is not really related to this. My you know my name is like I have an a first my generation we all have first English names they were called Christian names almost like the civilized names so mm -hmm. Oscar and then Mwanga, so you find people from my generation having that first name, which was English. And that was almost like saying, you know, I'm civilized now because my children, they have first English name. What I discovered was my mother didn't, when, when she's in the village with me, she never called me Oscar, she called me Osiga, mm. which was almost like wrestling it to our, the way we would say it. But when she was among the urban elite, she still called me Oscar. So it made, it made me think about how we can wrestle with, with you know, with, you know with uh, colonization in, in a way that even what is pre present can be can be fought and made our own. So we have to ask ourselves the question, you know, how can this basketball, which is there, be turned into something that is useful for us? And then, you know, uh, in terms of uh, 
uh, you know, indigenous sports and indigenous games. Uh, there is a side where the government has to really get involved in this, support uh, policies that begin to, to facilitate you know, games and, to, and, and indigenous games. But I think if our population thinks basketball is cooler than traditional games, nothing is going to happen. So I think the government and the stakeholders must begin, begin to promote the pride of who we are uh, in, in, in our spaces. Uh, and uh, and, and uh, that conversation for me must be had not just in the policy spaces, but in the academic spaces. You know, what do we teach our children? If, for instance, my daughter has gone to school here in England, if the only thing she learns about England, about Zambia and how it relates to England is the fact that Zambia was, was civilized by England, why should, he be, should she be proud of indigenous games from Zambia? So we need to go to that conversation within the curriculum, to that learning in the curriculum that says, we need to challenge this. There's one history of what, in, what England tells about Zambia, and there's another story we don't know about what Zambia tells about England and how the two interacted. So it's about not history, but histories, I think. Mm. Wonderful, thank you so much. And then uh, what about the Olympics? Yes. <laughs> what are your then, thoughts on that? <laughs> I, I lost you on that one. What was the question again, Doc, on that one? Oh, um, just that um, primarily, and the origins of it, of course, is from the Eurocentric notion of, of what sports what sport is, um, and is there a way to kind of, um, you know, uplift um, other other uh, non-Western ideas of sports and athleticism? Yeah, so so there is. I think so. If you think about the Olympic values. They go with this notion that starts with uh, a Eurocentric perspective, almost this idea as if no other games existed anywhere else. It's only in Greece, mm. you know. So it starts with that idea, and then the values uh, start from a, a Eurocentric perspective. Eurocentric values they are promoted as such, and then they're universalized. So when they come to Zambia and the Philippines, they make you forget your own values. But when you look carefully, uh, you look. Look, for instance, an example of South Africa, the values of, 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 of harmony, the value of, of, of respecting the other, those values uh, resonate with, with, with Olympism. But the, but, the, but the South African, to engage, must forget that they actually have those values. So I think it's important to have the conversation that says, what values do you have in your local setup? And how do they interface with the with the Olympic values? Because they, when the Olympic values are assumed by pose in a native space, it's almost to say no other values existed before the Olympic values arrived. And uh, you can imagine how confusing that can be uh, when you look at places where there is more uh, community ness, uh, otherness, uh, relatedness more than what happens in the Western society. Uh, uh, and then you are going to tell them that here you don't have any values here the Olympic values. So I think I think we need to find a way of where you know those Olympic spaces we can begin to appreciate the fact that values are not coming only from the West, and universalization of values needs to be challenged and it needs to be fronted in in, in both our you know academic and, and 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 other spaces like the media as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Well, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bay, for so uh, Franzen. And uh, by the way, in the chat, I don't know if you've seen it, but she has shared her um, her TED talk as well as other links and notes and an upcoming book, which you need to tell us when it gets published so that we can share yeah. and spread the word. Yeah, it's probably early next year. It's now at the end end stages, uh, uh, published by Malgrave, Paul Grave McMillan, and it's on education and decolonial futures in the Philippines. Mm. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> <laughs> looking forward, looking forward. I'm going to drop you uh, an email. Uh, you know, hopefully I can get a free one. Yes, definitely. And let's collaborate. <laughs> thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. We will, definitely. Thank you. Um, thank you for the fantastic question. Then and, and and see now I, I I now I have to call you Oscar. Now just just to you know keep the keep the language uh, current going. Um, uh, thank you for that excellent excellent answer. A pair of answers. Friends, that's an example of a video question. Um, and uh, again, all you need to do is on the bottom of the screen, press the raised hand button. Uh, and before I can say that, we have another video person to bring up. Uh, and this is, I believe, Jana uh, Krechkova. 
Uh, please, John, tell me if I've totally destroyed your name. Uh, I believe it's Czech. How did how did I do? Hello. Uh, yes, uh, I am from Europe, from the Czech Republic, and um, I am recently thinking about uh, how to decolonize my university and. I would like to ask whether uh, you would uh, encourage uh, all lecturers across uh, scientific disciplines, across social sciences, natural sciences, to offer uh, students um, the uh, to offer students to reflect on their uh, positionality, and mm. yes, whether you would do it across uh, across uh, scientific disciplines and faculties. I, I think you, you completely nailed it. I think that's what it is. Uh, we cannot, you know, we, 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 it's almost scary to think of an education journey without uh, you know, engaging with positionality. Um, and and I think it has to be encouraged. It, it's, it's one of the ways that we can actually decolonize that students are, are reflecting about how they position themselves in time and space, um, and and really how they are constructed, uh, you know, within that, and, and 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 how they can bring that to bear within their education journey. And I think it's it, it's crucial. I mean, they, they 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 you know talking about Czech, for instance, one of the one of the things that is interesting to mention is that you know before the the colonial project there isn't one europe there's multiple europes there's there's, there's there's different cultures in europe but when europe goes to decolon to colonize other parts of the world it must create the idea that it's one the danger of that is that within that one other euro cultures are swallowed into that so you have the super cultures like maybe the german or the or, or the english culture so i think um, the, 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 your students can also understand the fact that, you know, when you talk about, sometimes when you talk about colonization, you always think, you know, oh, it was Europe going to Africa, but it is happening. Uh, the idea of coloniality is to hold people as a subset of another uh, more superior uh, place. So, so a colony becomes a subset of, of, of the motherland. So what you need is, is for your students to ask these questions. Uh, whether it's social sciences or, 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 or natural sciences, you know, how do they position themselves in the construction of knowledge? Mm. Thank you very much. Thank you, Yana. And, Thank uh, you very are, much. And are, are you in Praha right now? No, I am in Olomouc. Ah, excellent. Excellent. I have not been to Olomouc, although I knew a bit of the history. I have been to Praha and I like it very much. Um, thank you, and uh, have a good evening. Uh, friends, you can see that we have uh, questions coming from literally all over the world, and again, they can come in through video as well as through text. Um, so we also only have about eight and a half minutes left, so we have time for the last few questions. Um, and we have one uh, right now uh, coming from uh, our friend uh, Matthew Henry, who asks a technology question, uh, which I, I'm really fascinated by. Uh, he asks this. Um, I've talked with some entrepreneurs from around the world that are working in Africa using gamification or general uh, generative AI. Do you think that Africa can jump any technology gap? Yes, the answer is yes, definitely yes. Uh, but some things must happen before that jump can be uh, can be made possible. Mm. Uh, we talk about the 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 the, the, the digital divide. Um, how many? Africans would have access to these technologies. That's that's a real issue, uh, and 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 you know you know if that is addressed, then we can start to you know get excited about the possibility of using technology to make the jump. But no doubt um, the, the 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 young people in Africa, for instance, those that are able to access higher education, they are they are in a place where they are they are using more. Uh, of these modern technologies, uh, uh, and they are ahead of their own lecturers, believe it or not. I've been talking to colleagues. And so what happens is uh, they pretend they don't know uh, generative uh, AI. When they come to class, they pretend they have got no knowledge about you know, mm. how to, to do this, because then it positions 
it reinstates their lecturers in position of power and influence within the classroom space. So um, I think we'll have to go and think of programs of how we can uh, empower uh, the lecturers to look at how generative AI becomes an enabling technology in the education process. Uh, and and uh, other, you know, without that, it becomes a very, it creates a conflict between the young people that have got uh, efficacy to these technologies and, and the lecturers that are holding on to traditional ways of how to uh, educate. Well, that's, uh, first of all, that's a really, really good question. Um, and uh, Matthew, and thank you, um, Dr. Mwanga, for turning that um, to focus not just on technology, but also on, on pedagogy itself. Um, we have uh, more questions coming, and here's a question for our good friend and former guest, uh, Stephen Ehrman, who has a question about languages, actually two questions. So first, how does the number of languages in colonized countries versus the smaller number of languages spoken by colonizers fit into your argument? And can colonizers understand the colonized without speaking their language? Here, I'll, I'll flash that on the screen again, because that, 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 that's a good one. That is really, really a good one, yeah. So so how does the languages of a, in a colonized country uh, versus the small language spoken by the colonizer? So yeah, to bring this into context, Zambia, for instance, has got 70 dialects. Wow. Um, and, and a population of 20, 20 million people. Uh, Tanzania will have 20, 200 dialects, tribal dialects. Now, these tribal dialects are not just dialects. I mean, they're, uh, you know, traditional, uh, culturally different ways of, of, of life. So there will be similarities in some, but the way they do their agriculture, the way they educate their children will be fairly different. So, you know, so it is, it is from a very philosophical perspective, it is a very good question that we must engage with, not that we'll find an exact answer, because when you get to the answer of how do we actually deal with this, it has got economic cost. So what we do in Zambia, for instance, we have got 10 provinces, I believe we do, and uh, there, there seems to, the, the, the government then says each province, the one main uh, dialect, and then that dialect has to be, you know, uh, it has to be used in the education of the children, in the books. It has to be seen in, in, in all that. So, uh, so what, what I would say is that it's, it's, it's a very difficult thing, but we don't shy away from the debate. We don't shy away from the conversation. And sometimes we, we engage in the conversation not because we can get a practical solution, but because we need to have these kind of questions. We need to ask these kind of questions. Because if we don't, we go for the easy one, which is just have English for everyone. And when you have English for everyone, there you go. You start to, uh, to in, you know, to colonize again or to to promote coloniality. Because what you are saying is that if these tribal dialects are traditional, uh, are cultural ways of engaging, then you are erasing them so you can have one, which is the English of engaging in the world. So you are telling them uh, your your way of knowing is not acceptable. Uh, so if you want to go ahead. Here is one way, which is the English way. So I think it's important, and I acknowledge it's a difficult one, but yeah, it's important that we accept this conversation. Okay. Well, again, whoop. thank you. Um, that's an excellent answer, uh, Stephen, uh, and for a terrific question. And we have some uh, uh, we have some very very deep um, implications here for for language. Uh, thank you. We have another question um, that is coming up from Miss um, K, and let me bring uh, this stay, this question up on the screen. Would you say to shift our mindset from such a narrative, we need to move from a traditional approach as an African woman to being more liberal and less submissive in a gender arena? Yeah, so uh, I think before we get uh, to that question, we, we need to be very sure we have an understanding of, we've lost understanding of who we are. Uh, because uh, I, my my tribal group in Zambia is called the Tongas. Uh, and I, I, I could look at my sisters and, 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 and my mothers and say, you know, they, they need to be 
they need to be in a particular way that that supports sort of like the the patriarchy which is uh, where we are but without an understanding it's dangerous you know so what what, what you, you begin to where, where you start from is really not just you know the easy things of saying you know let's have you know women uh, to have a voice well if women have a voice and no one is listening to the voice you know can create spaces where that voice can be heard within within that so i think to respond to that without being very exact, I think we, our starting point is really uh, the understanding of the lost cultures which have been erased by coloniality. You know, so uh, <clears throat> for instance, if you look at the African setup, it's very easy for you to say women uh, are not, you know, they, they, they don't have power within that setup. But my mother had a way of, has a way of saying it. She says, you know, your your father is is the head. Clearly, she's the he's the head, but I'm the neck that makes the head turn the different ways it should. So, in, in trying to bring in that understanding of what, how my mother sees the world, it's important to really have an understanding of you know where we are in terms of, of the views of that culture, um, because in the Western culture will come in and say all you need to do is to give women voices. Uh, and then if those voices are not respected and not supported, you, you further alienate uh, women and girls. Well, thank you. Uh, thank you for that very, very thoughtful answer. And uh, Ms. Kay, thank you for the, uh, for the really, really uh, important question. Uh, I'm afraid that uh, we have to draw things to a close because uh, in, in, in this wonderful conversation, we have already just gone through an entire hour, which amazes me. Um, Dr. Mwanga, thank you so much. This has been uh, just wonderful to hear all of your all of your thoughts on this. Uh, I really appreciate how you've tackled each of our questions. Uh, one question I have for you now, which is how can we keep up with your work? What is the best way to pe for people to find out about your projects on physical education and decolonizing the curriculum? Well, yeah, um, yeah, you could come to the, the, the University of London uh, Centre for Online and Distance Education uh, our website. I'll be happy to share that with you, uh, and and you can find uh, the work that I'm doing. And um, yeah, and I'm happy to to share my email. So really looking forward to collaborate. I I, I got a sense that there is great, uh, uh, you know, people here today that are doing great works, and I think it's it's it, it, the power is in our diversity and in our collectiveness in terms of imagining. Uh, you know, mm. the, the, what we want in the, the future that we can co-create. Quite right. Quite right. Well, thank you. Thank you very much for that. And thank you so much. Please keep doing this great work. Good luck with this work. And I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing you again. Thank you. thank you. Thank you very much for the invite. And thank you very uh, everyone for joining us today. My pleasure. My pleasure. But don't go away yet, friends. Uh, let me just point out uh, where we're headed next. Um, but as I'm bringing up those slides, let me just say thank you all uh, for the really, really excellent and thoughtful questions. If you'd like to keep talking about these questions of decolonizing higher education and the curriculum, everything from languages to technology, we can keep talking about this on all the social media platforms there are. Uh, you can find me here on Twitter or on LinkedIn, Mastodon, Threads, or Blue Sky. Just use the hashtag uh, FTTE. Uh, if you'd like to look into our previous sessions, including the ones on decolonization, uh, just go to our archive at tinyurl.com slash fdfarchive. If you'd like to look into our upcoming sessions on a wide range of topics, uh, please just go to the forum website, forum.futureofeducation.us, and you can see more of these. Uh, friends, if, uh, if nobody objects uh, there in the chat, I would love to include uh, the chat transcript in a blog post about this one because there are so many resources and so many good ideas. I'd love to share all of these. Uh, I will anonymize you all, of course. Uh, if anyone has any objections, please put them there in the chat right now. Uh, otherwise, let me thank you again for a brilliant hour of conversation. Uh, I'm really hoping that all of you who are in the Northern Hemisphere are enjoying the last bits of summer heading into autumn. And those of you in the Southern Hemisphere, I hope you're enjoying the same switch of seasons just from the other way around. I hope everyone is safe and sound. Take care, everybody. We'll see you next time online. Bye-bye.